This lecture is about fundamental versus composite particles and the standard model, which, which is basically a model of all particles that fundamentally exist. A composite particle is a particle made of other smaller particles, so it's composed of smaller particles. A fundamental or elementary particle is a particle that is not made of other smaller particles. It cannot be broken up into smaller pieces. A very long time ago, people believed that the atom was a fundamental particle, that you could not split an atom into smaller pieces. But we learned later that atoms are composed of smaller pieces. They're composed of protons and neutrons and electrons. So because they can be broken up into smaller pieces, we say that atoms are composite particles. And we've learned that electrons are actually fundamental particles. It's not possible to break an electron down into smaller pieces. We also know that protons and neutrons actually are made up of smaller particles. So protons and neutrons are actually also composite particles. These smaller particles that make up protons and neutrons are called quarks. And quarks actually are fundamental particles. It's not possible to break them down anymore into smaller particles. So there are many other composite particles and many other fundamental particles, and the rest of this video is going to be introducing all the fundamental particles that exist, or at least all the ones you need to worry about in IB physics. There's no easy way to organize these particles, and there's no way I can display what they really truly look like, because they don't really look like anything. They're too small to interfere with photons in the way that regular objects do. So in thinking about the best way to present these particles, I've decided on this system, where I'll display information about a particle in a box like this, with the name of the particle written above the box in the same color as the box. So I'll display facts about the particle, and if there are other particles that are types of that first particle, I'll display those in a smaller box within the larger box, and I can put facts about that subcategory of particles here. I'll do an example with particles that you are familiar with. So we know that nucleons exist in the nucleus of an atom. And I know that one type of nucleon is a proton. And a fact about a proton is that it has a charge of positive E. And then neutrons have a charge of zero. So this is how I would use this visual system to display facts about particles that you already know about. The thing that I like about physics is that there's very little memorization involved for the most part. You get a few simple facts and can build a very complicated system out of them. Particle physics is one of the areas that unfortunately does require a lot of memorization. So what I'm about to show you is basically all of the facts that you're going to have to memorize or at least understand about the fundamental particles for IB physics. So emotionally prepare yourself. This is a chart of everything that IB physics students specifically are expected to know about the fundamental particles, as well as some information about composite particles. I'm going to take you on a tour through this image. I've also linked a picture of this in the description that you can download if you'd like it at a higher resolution. So feel free to use that as well. You can see, first of all, that I'm displaying information about fundamental particles on the left and composite particles on the right. And there are four main types of fundamental particles we're going to be worried about. Quarks in purple, leptons in yellow, exchange particles in green, and then at the very bottom right, you can see I also have the Higgs boson. So I'm using this organizational system to show you which particles exist in each category and some information about them. All the composite particles we're going to worry about are called hadrons. And you can see they're grouped into two subcategories of baryons and mesons. I'll start by going over fundamental particles and then go over to composite particles. So I'll go over quarks, leptons, exchange particles, and the Higgs boson, but first I just need to say some information about antiparticles. And as I'm going through this, some of this information isn't going to make visual sense to you. Like when I talk about a baryon number and a lepton number, there's no real way to visualize what that actually is outside of some visual metaphors. So right now I basically just need you to get this information down and we can start to use it to solve problems later. So every kind of fundamental particle has an antiparticle, which is a particle with the same mass but opposite electrical charge, strangeness, baryon number, and lepton number. So an antiparticle is basically the opposite of the original particle. To label an antiparticle, we draw the letter symbol for the original particle with a horizontal line above it. As an example, lowercase u is a symbol for an up quark, which has a charge of positive two-thirds, a strangeness of zero, and a baryon number of plus one-third. So according to this rule for antiparticles, U with a line above it is an anti-up quark with a charge of negative two-thirds E, a strangeness of zero, and a baryon number of negative one-third. You also need to know that if a particle's antiparticle has the same exact properties as the original particle, we say that the particle is its own antiparticle. And if a particle and its antiparticle collide, they annihilate and release energy, specifically in the form of photons. So like I said, there are four fundamental particles, and I'll take you on a quick tour of each one. So first we have the quarks. Quarks are the most massive of the fundamental particles. 
We're going to worry about them a lot. They make up hadrons like protons and neutrons. They experience the strong nuclear force, and all quarks have a baryon number of plus one third, and antiquarks have a baryon number of negative one third. The principle of quark confinement states that quarks and antiquarks never exist on their own. They only exist in pairs or in groups of three. All other fundamental particles can exist on their own. So there are six types of quarks. I won't run you through all six, I've just displayed their properties here. These are properties that you'll be given and you won't have to memorize them. You'll be given them in your data booklet. And I'm not going to take the time to list all six antiquarks because you can understand their properties by just flipping the properties of the original quarks. I've just left one quick example of an anti-strange quark here on the bottom. The next type of fundamental particle is a lepton. Leptons are much less massive than quarks, and they don't experience the strong nuclear force. All leptons have a lepton number of 1, and antileptons have a lepton number of negative 1. There are actually only six leptons and their antiparticle. So the six leptons are electrons, muons, and tau particles, and then electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos, and then you can have antiversions of each of those particles that just have the opposite values as the original leptons. Sometimes the curriculum mentions positrons, but a positron is just an anti-electron. It was given a separate name, but it's a normal antiparticle, and its lepton number is negative one. So that's the information about leptons. Then we can go over to exchange particles, which are virtual particles that mediate or carry or transmit the four fundamental forces between interacting particles. So these are a little strange. They kind of exist to communicate the four fundamental forces between two objects. Of these, we have the graviton, the photon, the gluon, and then a W plus, W minus, and Z zero bosons. So you can see the graviton is responsible for gravity, the photon is responsible for the electromagnetic force, the gluon is responsible for the strong nuclear force, and those three bosons on the bottom are responsible for the weak nuclear force. Obviously there's some more information about each of these, and you can see that the graviton, photon, and Z zero boson are all their own antiparticle. Finally, on the bottom, we have the Higgs boson, and the only thing you need to know about the Higgs boson is that it was discovered a few years ago, and it is its own antiparticle. There's so much more information I could talk about with all of these, but this is the information that you're expected to know in IB physics specifically. Going on to composite particles, all the composite particles we're going to talk about are hadrons. Hadrons are made of quarks, so they're made of combinations of those six types of quarks. They experience both the weak and strong nuclear force. And an important rule to know is that as quarks separate from each other in a hadron, the strong nuclear force does not decrease in strength and pulls them together or creates new quarks. There are two types of hadrons. There are baryons, which are made up of three quarks, and all baryons have a baryon number of one. Two familiar baryons that we've encountered before are protons and neutrons. Protons are made up of two up quarks and one down quark, and neutrons are made up of two down quarks and one up quark. Many other baryons exist, and you're only expected to know that these other baryons always contain three quarks and no antiquarks, and that the baryon always has the same properties as the properties of the three quarks added together. So just going back to quarks for a second, I know that a proton is made up of two up quarks and one down quark, and if I look over at the up and down quark, I can see that the up quark has a charge of positive two thirds, and the down quark has a charge of negative one third. So if I add two up quarks and one down quark, that's going to be two thirds plus two thirds minus one third, which is equal to three thirds. So that means that the charge of the proton should be positive one. So that means that the charge of the proton should be equal to the charge of the three quarks added together, which is equal to positive three over three, which is equal to one, which is correct. That is the charge of one proton. So hadrons have the same properties as the quarks that make them up. The other type of hadron we're going to worry about are mesons, which are made of a quark and an antiquark. And there are lots of mesons, but you only need to know that they always contain a quark and an antiquark. The quark and antiquark can be different types of quarks, and that the meson always has the same properties as the quark and the antiquark added together. We call all of this together the standard model, which is the best description we have of literally all that exists in the universe. So when people talk about the standard model of physics, they're really talking about this general group of facts, which attempts to unify literally everything that we see in the universe. This is the information you'll be given about quarks, leptons, and exchange particles in your IB physics data booklet. If I could change anything about the data booklet, I would just add that the charge for some leptons is negative one times the elementary charge. It's not just negative one, so just watch out for that. That should say negative one E instead of negative one, but that's how they printed it in the data booklet. So this is information that you will not need to memorize specifically. So as an example here for quarks, you can see I have the up, charmed, and top quark that have a charge of two-thirds E, and a down, strange, and bottom quark that have a charge of negative one-third E. 
So as an example, if I wanted to understand the quarks that go into a proton, I know from the giant chart of the standard model that a proton has an up and an up and a down quark. And I can use this table to find the charge and baryon number of the proton just using these quarks. So an up quark has a charge of positive 2 thirds E, and a down quark has a charge of negative 1 third E. So those add together to make a charge of 1 E, which is the charge of a proton. And then the baryon number is just going to be 1 third plus 1 third plus 1 third. According to the table, all of these have a baryon number of 1 third. And these add together to make 1, which is the baryon number of any baryon. And then for the neutron, I know that's composed of an up, down, down quark. So I could find the charge and baryon number for that. And when I do that, it fits my expectation. The charge is 0, and the baryon number is 1. This is an example problem of something you could be asked about quarks specifically on a test. A lambda baryon is composed of the three quarks up, down, strange. Show that the charge is 0 and the strangeness is negative 1. So I know that up plus down plus strange is equal to a lambda particle. So I can find the charge and the strangeness. And I can see that the up quark has a charge of 2 thirds. The down quark has a charge of negative 1 third. And the strange quark also has a charge of negative 1 third. So the charge here is 0. And the strangeness is going to be 0 plus 0 plus negative 1. Because according to the bottom of that table, all quarks have a strangeness number of 0, except for the strange quark that has a strangeness number of negative 1. Here's another example problem. The omega negative particle is a baryon which contains only strange quarks. Deduce the strangeness of the omega negative particle. So if this is strange plus strange plus strange, I know that each individual strange quark has a strangeness of negative 1. So this comes out to be negative 3. We'll worry about leptons and exchange particles in future videos on conservation laws and on Feynman diagrams. I'm going to close the video with six more problems. These are all slightly modified problems taken from actual IB tests. I'm basically doing this just to show you that even though the table at the beginning was intimidating, these problems themselves are not too difficult as long as you've memorized some basic facts. The first problem says distinguish between hadrons and leptons. So hadrons experience the strong force and leptons do not. And hadrons are made of quarks and not fundamental, but leptons are fundamental and aren't made of anything smaller. The next one says state the quark structures of a meson and a baryon. A meson is a quark-antiquark -quark pair, and a baryon is a combination of three quarks. The next question says state why pi mesons are not considered to be elementary particles. So I don't know what a pi meson is specifically, but just because it's a meson, I know that all mesons are quark-antiquark -quark pairs, which means they are made of smaller particles and are therefore by definition not fundamental. The next question says which particle is acted on by both the strong nuclear force and the Coulomb force. So I know from the chart that an antineutrino is a lepton, and leptons do not experience the strong nuclear force, so the answer can't be A. And it can't be B either, because an electron is also a lepton which doesn't experience the strong nuclear force. So it has to be C or D. These are both baryons which do experience the strong nuclear force. But I need one that also experiences the Coulomb force, which is another name for the electrostatic force, so that's only experienced by charged objects. And a neutron is not charged, but a proton is, so the answer here is D, it's a proton. The next question says state the name of a particle that is its own antiparticle. Here I can just take from the table and say that could be a photon, or a graviton, or a Higgs boson, or a Z0 boson. Finally, state what is meant by the term elementary particle. So that's just a particle that cannot be broken up into smaller particles. So that's what you need to know about fundamental versus composite particles and the standard model. In the next lecture, I'll show you how to apply some more complicated conservation laws to this information to solve problems in particle physics.